and I want to be clear, I don't believe in the financialization of human interaction. I think that's where Web3 is overstepping. I think we want to financialize everything when in reality, we need to get products that users want to use, regardless of any price in the market. That was Patrick McNally. A few notes before today's episode. This is one of those shows where I'm just blown away by the breadth of the topics that we covered. And what else could you expect when today's guest is a musician, mechanical engineer, Solana developer, and overall, very smart and funny. We start with our fondest memories from East Denver, and then very quickly moving to a very raw and honest conversation about lessons learned from an unsuccessful NFT project. The conversation ranges from the creatives to entrepreneurial advice and the technical. You're about to hear from Patrick the commonality between rocketry, crypto, music, and much more. Finally, if you're wondering, yes. The current beats that you're listening to were also made by him. Thank you, sir. I hope you're enjoying them, and I hope that you enjoy today's show. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Wild User Interviews podcast with me, AVB. Today, I am thrilled to have with me Patrick McNally, also known as Snappy Jim on the interwebs. Patrick is an old friend, one of the many acquaintances I made during ETH Denver. He is currently also working with Cypher Protocol and a self-proclaimed shitcoin enthusiast. We'll see whether that sentiment holds in the current markets. Welcome, Patrick. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on, Alejandro. Mate, I am actually so happy to have you on. It's been a long time and every time that we have such a good time. Certainly. It was awesome meeting you and Ethan Denver, and it's been like, honestly, really fast paced since then. Like a lot of opportunities came out of that. It was a great place to be. Markets were up more than they were now, are now. It's just how it goes. But maybe in hindsight, that was the top. Conferences always end up putting in some sort of local top. I'm not even sure like what it is, but regardless, it was happy to meet you there. And it's great to be on the show. If we had to agree that conferences are the top. I would argue that Miami was the top. <laughs> yeah, Ethan Denver was smooth sailing. It was all builders. You didn't have to pay for the ticket. I actually really liked the ethos. I wasn't at Miami, so I shouldn't really be shitting too much about it. But I know that the Miami vibe is a bit different, is a bit more show offy. It was certainly more you've made it, thereby you're in Miami. But anyway, yeah. I think that there's definitely. A few other things wrong with the market beyond conferences. But yeah, just before we jump in the, into the market and uh, things go sour pretty quickly, maybe we can tell for the people that were not there our ETH Denver experience. Totally. What so. do you remember? Because I think I've got a version of events that may be unique, maybe just in my head. I don't know. I'll relay that after you. Well, this could be controversial, but I think I was relatively disappointed in a lot of the events at ETH Denver. But the one caveat to that was the near house. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on a near show here, but go, I'm trying to get sponsorship. You, you keep shit. <laughs> <laughs> we like, did money. Cool. The people were like way more helpful. And I was with a few developers from like Jet Protocol and some other like Solana protocols. And it was like mind boggling to, to speak with them and, and see the support the near team offered compared to all the other events. And it was like, hey, let's like follow along. Let's show you how to use our chain. Let's like tell you why we made these engineering decisions. And it, it like made a lot of sense. And ever since then, I, uh, I've been like doing a lot. I've been involved with Nier here and there. I'm now like working on it's an interchain world. I'm not like a chain maximalist by any, in any sense. I do believe though that Nier has got a lot of great people behind it. Actually, it may be a pretty solid statement to that multi-chain world on our open-mindedness to engage with other people that it didn't even occur to me to mention in the introduction that you're actually the first guest of the protocol that is technically building on a different chain. So you're building on Solana at the moment. Cypher protocols on Solana. Fantastic. Fantastic audience tunes out. <laughs> yeah. Nah, nah. Yeah, I do think it's like purely a function of like 
where developers are migrating to and whatever chain like makes developing easiest it's like in the short term going to be the place people go previously like solidity was on ethereum like one of the only places that like had a lot of developer support and only like in the past two years like really dear we saw a lot of developer resources come out like on solana like anchor framework and i'm not sure what the equivalent is for that on near but like the perpetual abstraction of like developer tools and some really important, especially in web two. And we're seeing that like now it's super early for like web three and like blockchain system stuff. But I certainly think that's the case. I started playing with a, with a microphone. I, I bought this fancy mic and I never know which is the right angle that I should be speaking into it. Let's just hope the audio is good. If we go back to ETH Denver, I guess I should start by applauding your curiosity i do remember you were one of the few students that ventured into the neo lounge and you know, with a little backpack and you're like looking out in the world <laughs> and you're literally like, i don't really know anyone i don't know what i'm doing here so i took it upon myself as i'm not a developer and i was just there at the conference to talk shit with people i was like hey how's it going and i don't know exactly i think i introduced you to rain and she offered you a yep. job, like jobs were being offered uh, very uh, loosely at that lounge. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I do remember that you mentioned you had an NFT project about to launch on Solana. And at first I wasn't very impressed because every man of the dog has an NFT project. <laughs> yeah. But then you showed me the website and I was like, holy shit, this is really cool. So a few things really struck out to me. The first one was just how well the website was made. Like it just looked professional. It looked like it had a very high level of detail. And the second thing that struck to me is that it wasn't just NFTs as in the art, but there were NFT, NFTs with music embedded with them. So I immediately started an attempt or a campaign to convert you guys over to Nier. I introduced you to Jordan, to the 10K team, just trying to pull as, as many resources to try to make a convincing argument that perhaps Nier would be the better place to launch the NFT. I'll let you expand a bit more on the project and the experience launching the project on Nier. But yes, I guess that's just a very long winded way to say that the campaign or the efforts to let people know what your protocol has to offer and to try to convert people over yeah. are never done. You never know who may be a developer <clears throat> looking for information, looking for a project. And we're back. Okay, I think I fixed it. How are you, sir? Doing well. Done, done from the fire rug. Nice. I'm very glad that you are not dead. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, we're just talking before the fake fire alarm about... Oh, what were we talking about? We were talking about like the music project on Near and how you like you invest in people, not protocols, sometimes both. But yeah, we were speaking about just how awesome the Near Foundation was when we were there at East Denver, and like how I was going to watch Man of Deep at Solana, and you converted me to Near. Yes, I recall now. Yeah. There were a couple of things uh, that I wanted to touch on. One was that energy. I guess it's really like the humility and like the ambition, the enthusiasm of an early stage ecosystem. And the second one would be the developer tools. And yeah, yeah. there's been a few interesting developments on the near side. But before that, I wanted to give you a chance to please explain properly like pitch share your project circa the one that i loved and i believe i was one of the only mentors let's go we had a few people which were actually in the process of we can cut this part out i really want to share that we're refunding people right now just because they felt bad why refunds because i felt like we, we never, because our developer Rashawn is working here now, we never had time to roll out like the beat redemption side of things. And so it felt because we didn't deliver the, and I'm also refunding people at prices that near was when they minted. The 14 near mint turned into a 90 near compensation. What the fuck? Yeah. No, you should just give them back the near that they gave you. It's worth it's does it matter? 35%. Yeah, I does just it matter? Like, there was that's a, the market. 
It's true. There's only a few people who meant it. And I wanted to like maintain a good impression of these people who like, who wanted to. No, like, no, you rocked them. <laughs> <laughs> but has anyone actually complained? Oh, we, I mean, we, we had a few people like, what's going on with the project? And um, I was just like, hey guys, I'm sorry. We didn't get everything, but like what we can put in the interview or this thing. As we can talk, I'll talk about generally high level what we're trying to do and how the idea is not dead. We're just like reassessing the opportunity in the market for a later time period down the road. And like the important part was like the vision that we had and the musicians that we had involved because they're all like still making music and like becoming very talented musicians. And I'll just start here because essentially the project was designed I'm a musician and I've always wanted to combine my musicianship with Web3 stuff, but I didn't want to do it in generic fundraising way that a lot of like protocols employ. I wanted to share the value of the music that my musician friends and myself make. And one of the main ways I wanted to do that was recreate what you would find on BeatStar, which is essentially a platform in which you can go and find beats that are available for download you can purchase them and can use them and like rap songs or whatever like music you're making and we wanted to bring that to the near protocol we wanted to do it where you had this element of like metaverse art as well and so you could throw it in your metaverse we had 3d assets kind of like the whole nine yards and it was pretty cool because i felt like it was one of the first iterations of like music nfts that came kind of based off the web two model that like works instead of trying to like overcharge people for like maybe value that like you're not actually adding. And so I wanted to be a project that was going to be adding a lasting value to the near community and integrating with an ecosystem of projects that were there to stay. And all the musicians that were involved don't regret a single second of it because we had an awesome time doing our live studio sessions in our Discord, making music with like Discord folks as well. And it was just like a lot of fun. And I like, it turned out a bummer because like the market. And I think that there were a few other external events that had like in real life events that caused us to kind of reassess the market opportunity. But we'd made whole with the community and are certainly going to not forget this idea, but learn from it and be better because of kind of the project itself. I love the concept. And in fact, I think our friend Roshan recommended that I should have you in the podcast because I guess we're hilarious and we have such a good time when we're together. But also, I guess a trigger for me to actually reaching out was, I think I shared with you the experience that I had. This is like free stock music like the marketing like the whole messaging the core value proposition on your face is like royalty free stock music and i was starting the podcast i was like look this may not succeed you want to keep costs down and i just checked it out and there were a couple of tunes with like a happy beat and i was like this probably works for the podcast so anyway 15 podcasts in i finally start catching up with the youtube so I've got recordings of other podcasts. The main form of distribution is like the audio only. So I use Transistor.fm. It's an amazing platform that automatically, so I only upload to Transistor and they automatically distribute to all the platforms, including like Overcast and a bunch of platforms that I didn't even know existed. One of the stories, as I start uploading videos to YouTube, uh, I start getting copyright claims. And I was like, what the fuck? I was like, I've been getting copyright claims on this free music that I meant to have a license for. And I started contesting the copyright claims and stuff. I was getting all angry. And then I read the fine print and it is free, but it has to be used for like non-commercial purposes. So basically for 30 seconds of music at the beginning of my two hour podcast, they now claim all advertising revenue for the podcast, which is great because I've got like seven views. But going forward, you can start to see how this could potentially be an issue. So anyway, the first thought that comes to mind is at some point, you're just going to pay for things. 
there's a, there's a famous saying that cheap things turns out to be more expensive. I 100% agree. And then I heard, so if I had to pay for music, I know that there are a lot of like web three musicians and there's like an entire movement within the year. So let's try to go to the community and bring in like some sick new beats. And then I thought, wait, I own some sick new beats from Circa. So anyway, I was really excited to message you. And in fact, depending on when we release these episode, we may already have the new beats. You may have heard them at the intro. Yes. Yeah. I think we like all those beats are still there. So I would love to go and, and, and grab a few and, and see what we can do with those in here as well. And I can also do custom stuff as well. I think it's such a long way to say that it doesn't really matter what the success of the product appears to be in regards to like mint or whatever. Every experiment, it's probably like a stepping stone to the next one. And it is certainly a really good, the way that I see it, it probably helped you guys to get to where you are now, because both you and Rashan are working for Solana and Nier. Did he accept the offer? I think he did. That's fantastic. That's I'll a great. Let him tell you, but I, I believe he did. That's amazing. So there you go. And now potentially you're getting me to use some of the beats or get custom beats. And who knows, maybe some people listening to these like those beats, like that work. And next thing you know, you're the headlining DJ at DeerCon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think like well, your point that you made though about like the copyright issues on YouTube is like a really important problem that we can solve. And one of the things we wanted to do is we're going to scale out this idea as in the refinement currently. But if you've got some sort of service that can communicate with the YouTube and you can check and see if those songs are being used in YouTube videos, like on our project, and then you can go and you can check, you can query the wallet as well and look at the blockchain and like you can essentially verify that this person holds the rights to using this beat. And if they do, you can go, hey, yeah, you're good to use this in your YouTube video. And if you're not, then no, you get the copyright like signal. And I think it's really important because that's a, a really impactful way to refine the music copyright process. And because the conventional issue is making sure people are actually checking, like using those things without violating copyright laws. And so I think that's like part of the vision we want to build out and integrate your like web three wallet identity, but do that in a web two way where you already have business models that work and you've already got all of the, like the hurdles the companies had to cross previously. And then now we're taking in like streamlining that process. So I think that's like the direction that we want to take this in the future. To be fair though, in, in one of my appeals, angry lawyer in me surfaced from a past life and I was like, Hey, this is a website. This is a link. I, I referenced them in the description. And then I added a, a snarky little comment saying that the copyright claim was being made on behalf of this website by some random third party. And I said that like, I don't know who the person is or what the fuck. <laughs> After I sent in the challenge where the person that submits a claim can see, I Googled them. They call like Hawker or something. Yeah. And it's his entire basically bureaucracy where that's basically the service that they offer. So they mm -hmm. scan all the videos and they check for copyright and then they lodge the yeah. claims automatically. I'm not sure exactly how many data points they take. To be perfectly honest, I actually forgot to include the attribution in some of the videos. Maybe they checked, okay, the audio is there, but no attribution, copyright claim. So I added the proper attribution and then appealed and they took it away. So I think that in general, that would be like the web two approach of what you guys are describing. Yeah, exactly. And the cool thing is we could directly connect the artists with that and offer that as an entire packaged service. And so we have the platform in which artists are being compensated proportionally for their work and like how often it's being used. But then 
you basically can have artists decide these passes, right? These streaming passes that you're allowed to issue people. And you've got that third-party service already integrated with the Web3 version of this. And what it allows you to do is you're cutting out the middleman and you're likely rewarding artists like more proportionally for their work and allowing them to decide. And, and what you end up doing is like, you can even have DAOs in the future where you've got like a like mix of music, like a genre, like electronic genre. And you can go and you can choose. You can have a pass that allows you to use like a few different tunes from this like pool of music. And I think that's, I think I'd have to look into the engineering challenges because I haven't had time currently, but I think there are some really interesting models that arise with that kind of like privacy protection for artists, as well as like compensating them proportionally. So I think, yeah, like in its simplest form, it could combine that Web2 scraper service with the Web3 more like equal rewards for users. So, I mean, you see myself as a sample size of one, but I guess an ideal like customer segment, like perhaps the put the people that you want to get in through the door first. I think that there's also something that shifts psychologically when you have that relationship with the artist and when you introduce a notion of ownership. Like yep. to be honest, even if I didn't go guerrilla mode and started contesting all these copyright claims, I could have just paid nineteen bucks. Nineteen bucks gives me full rights to the little tunes and I can use them for commercial purposes for whatever I want but it's it's not I guess what that really says is it's not really about the money I would have probably paid the money if they weren't fucking suing me <laughs> <laughs> but also it's not the same paying the $19 for a song that can be sold many times over from a company that is generic that there's no connection yeah. there so I guess that I'd be willing to pay the same or more, but there's like an emotional connection with the music or a direct connection with the artist. Like even the the artwork for this podcast, which is amazing, was made by Insightwork. And we arguably didn't pay that much for it. That is a guilt I will carry with me until the end of days, but definitely it feels very special. I know that it is artwork that is recognized within the new community and Zidwarp continues to grow and evolve as an artist. So it's just amazing to be able to capture some of that in the podcast. That's we continue I think to grow and evolve as well. Your point is like prevalent because identity is a core component of Web3. And I think a lot of where Web2 falls short is the lack and the like obscurity of identity in kind of these business settings. And I think it, it, like your point's great. And it makes a lot of sense. Like if you can understand the artists and their story and tie it to a person and see their portfolio of work, I think it, it, it humanizes the process, which is we sacrifice, I think, the humanization of, of services for like efficiency a lot of times. And it's always about like, how efficient can we get this process? And I think a lot of times you like leave out the human. And I think that's one thing that Web3 has done better. The irony is that it's just pub keys on a blockchain, but I think you can build a lot more identity around that right public key than you can your like Google profile. And I think that people like have taken different personas on, they can have many different wallets and whatever. And I want to be clear, I don't believe in the financialization of human interaction. I think that's where Web3 is overstepping. I think we want to financialize everything when in reality, we need to get products that users want to use, regardless of any price in the market. And so I think it, it's like really important point you bring up that we need to humanize like the creators and the artists. And I don't necessarily mean that we should be paying them like tens of thousands of dollars for a single song. That's not sustainable. I do believe though, that there's like way more efficient models that we can work out that maintain like similar margins and better margins for artists, but not completely ripping off creators like yourself. And I have a, quite a few friends who are filmmakers who have the same issue. And it's, I think there's like a large potential both like from the market perspective, as well as connecting like humans across the world. Right? I think the humanization of services is like a very important step in a global internet. That, 
That is very well said, actually. Very well said. You could probably break it apart into two different layers. The first one would be like the technical or the technological layer, which is probably where most of the conversation happens. That is, I guess, very easy to summarize and to grasp on the Nier and Solana ecosystems because it is possible in both networks as opposed to other blockchains. So there you would be looking at microtransactions. But when you're talking about efficiency and how much you can get out of things, not only are you looking at maximizing the gains, but also looking at whether it's worth it, like the cost of doing so. So this may be a new model whereby the microtransaction model and everything being on chain and standardizing the smart contracts, you're basically removing, I would imagine that the most basic interaction with copyright lawyers would be tens of thousands of dollars. So yeah. only established artists have that. And if you're not there, you're in a gray area. So I think that the technological layer, it's pretty cool. And as I said, Nier and Solana are for that other blockchains, not quite. But the area that it gets, that, that really piques my interest is that second one, because is intangible. And maybe this will be really good during a bear market to explore more. I can see how during a bull market, everything got financialized because there was money to be made. <laughs> good things were worth a hundred times more its actual value. Shit things had value. Like it was a crazy time to be alive. But yeah, that emotional connection to things like, for instance, I looked at the May near town hall, which I'm guessing you may not have seen it, but I had a really good NFT deep dive by Jordan. You've met Jordan from 10K. Yeah. And he was explaining all the different type of NFTs. You've got the BFPs, which is just one category. Then you've got the one-on-one -on -one art. There's a wide range of use cases. And the one that really caught my attention, both because I'm trying to think of use cases, but also because he showcased some of the infrastructure available in the year to deploy that are proof of participation. And these are really hot because it connects people with that common denominator. So if you all go to one event, it's a historical thing. Like that event isn't going to happen or it's not going to happen in the same way. And there's only a limited number of people that were there. And you all share the same experiences, but how to capture that on the blockchain. And I was starting to think, just to put a really concrete example, say on my YouTube videos or on the podcast, halfway through, I can just have a QR code and the first hundred people that listen to it or watch it get to download the proof of participation of that episode. And some people would be like, well, that's really stupid. That's going to be A, worthless. And B, why would you do it? And I was like, yeah, but I spent so much time editing and thinking about the content. And I guess that a part of who goes into this podcast, they're like my little horcrux. Not many people may see the value in that, but the few people that do may be excited to connect with you through that. Hey, I was the first person yeah. to listen to this podcast or I've listened to all of them from day one. Who knows? This is podcast. I think 19 or 20, when we had 150 and all these big sponsors and I'm fighting Spotify for deals and stuff. Those VOPs <laughs> may be something cool to hold on to. There's most likely not going to be a secondary market for it, but it's something that you hold on to. It's just a living memory. Certainly. And your point there, I think, is well said as well. I think to summarize my experience as a musician is that a hundred super fans are always going to be more impactful than 10,000 medium fans or have, however you can say that like accordingly, but that's the model that like has powered like artists before the internet is like, how do I find my super fans? Like, where do I look? And I think mass adoption is super important for scalable products. But you, to get there, you need to have a hundred super fans or whatever that arbitrary number becomes. And those super fans, I think there's ways that we can reconnect with those people and enabled by web three technology. So I, I certainly agree with that. The challenge that I see to some extent, I probably have some mild ADHD. So for me, it's normal to like grasp with nine ideas at the same time. But I feel like a lot of people actually struggle to identify and understand 
that you do have to wrestle with many different kinds of people for the same product at the same time. And a big problem when you try to standardize everyone is that you always go for the lowest common denominator. So if you go for the musician, can you fill out a venue selling tickets for 15 bucks? You probably could. Are there people in that venue that would pay 150 bucks worth of an actual CD or a vinyl and merch and they want to hang out with you? Yes. Are there people that would pay a thousand, maybe one or two? So the long tail or whichever way you place it, there are people willing to pay more. In the same way, there's going to be a shit ton of people on the streets that will not even sit there if you pay them. So trying to go for that wider net of people ends in the tragic result of you actually devaluing your work or the perception of your work. Well, you want to have a million followers on Instagram. So you end up doing basic stuff that other people do to get them to a million instead of doing the unique things. Like you may only have 25,000, but these people are crazy. Like they will yeah. travel around the country following you like tour after tour and it's like your tribe. So yeah, I think that you can probably find many different parallels of how that works. And yeah, I think that it's probably an invitation for people to start thinking, okay, taking into account all these different customer segments, what can I do for the masses? What can I do for the really special people? And yeah, certainly monetize somewhere along the way. I think that financial concerns are <laughs> certainly more present now than in previous podcasts, but. Certainly. And that's for people, I think, although it's important to realize across like the entire world and even outside of crypto, I think it's like a pretty difficult time globally. And it's important to take that into consideration as well. And like the biggest thing that we can do is help provide opportunities for people anywhere to be able to help monetize what they're good at. And I think part of the reason that it's so important to find those initial super fans is because it's about extrapolating like those users. It's like, if I can find a hundred people who love my work, then I can probably find a thousand people who can, who will like it. And then maybe a hundred thousand people who will listen to it once. And I think your point about like picking a demographic, like somewhere on that curve is pretty important because if you take into consideration your art, like who you're trying to reach. But I certainly think that a lot of people will use that to extrapolate out on. And sometimes it can be tough because maybe there are a hundred thousand people and maybe you should just focus on like your hundred super fans, but it's like about scaling at the end of the day. Have you ever seen, I don't really watch much TV. This is probably why actually. Those TV series are really weird about people that collect stuff. And the common thread across all these like obsessive collectors is that they have the most random shit. <laughs> but like this true. amounts of it. And it's somehow worth a lot of money. Like somebody owns like a t-shirt that Elvis Presley wore once and it's all full of sweat. And you're like, why? So I guess it, it's an interesting example because it both highlights how there is very high value to things that create a connection between fan yep. uh, and creator, but also the area of opportunity now is that in the past, the infrastructure available to enable the creation of markets for those special items was much more limited. Unless you somehow have a way to prove that Elvis Presley wore that shirt once and he sweat all over it, probably somebody threw a drink at him, whatever. And you have an auction house and you have a bizarre TV series about it. It didn't exist. But can yeah. you imagine all the special digital items that are going to be created that are going to enable for any musician anywhere in the world? to be able to create those special items and potentially create marketplaces for them as well. That's pretty cool to think about actually. Yep. You're certainly right. I do think it is quite interesting to think about. And yeah, your, your point about 
go into those questions. And those obscure shows, you can fight fine as long as you can get your workout to enough people. Generally, you can find some form of a common denominator, whether that's one person, 10 people, or 100. So, yeah, I also agree with that point. No, it's pretty good. Okay. I'm going to take a two-minute break because I had a headache and I started drinking way too much water. But when we come back, I would love to hear how you got into the wonderful world of crypto. And then we can look into, I guess, like your educational background, how you've transitioned from uni into Solana, and we can start crafting a path for you to come join us on the near side. How does that sound? <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Two is it? Okay. Two minutes. We're back. Fantastic. Yeah. Take it away. How did you get into the wonderful world of crypto? Yeah. So I am like traditionally trained as like a mechanical engineer and so I like have not finished uni yet. I'm in the process of becoming a mechanical engineer, about two years in currently. But I actually, yeah, I don't even understand. I look back sometimes and I wonder how I got into even engineering in general. But because I've been a musician my entire life, I started playing classical violin when I was like three. I played about 19 years of classical violin, and I yeah done like a lot of music throughout my life and i made a song give music i write a lot of music and it like really inspired me to like i go to space and i was like wow i want to build a rocket and like early high school kind of constructed this completely homemade rocket it went to fourteen thousand feet and broke this sound barrier even the motor was homemade in my basement it's like making like what are you serious? I'm serious. I'm serious. Is this legal? Did you have to? It's legal for the per. Sure. And just about as legal as like most of the NFT fundraisers that we've seen. And yeah, but an NFT doesn't literally go through the moon on the pathway of like airplanes and whatever else flies. No. So I did. I The FAA was aware of my rocket like being launched so i was not like taking chances of hurting anybody here and that is a year it's cool yeah <laughs> do you watch youtube tutorials like how do you learn how to build a rocket that can break the barrier of sound yeah so i actually it took a decent amount of learning and time certainly but i textbooks are the best place to go for this in-depth domain specific knowledge and so ordered a few textbooks did a lot of learning and a lot of blowing up things and a lot of failed experiments but at the end of the day like what the lesson that it taught me was that the access to education in this world is unprecedented and if you have the drive to learn something there is information out there to learn it and it's only gotten better since then. That was like five years ago. From there, my engineering career really started. And I was going to music school. I was convinced of it. And after building this rocket and like having it work and not like hurting anybody or myself in the process, I was like, I love rocketry. And I was like, okay, what can I do to like continue to build rockets? And when I got to uni, I was like, I want to build these suborbital rockets that will take scientific experiments up in like microgravity and do all these things and within a few months i quickly learned that the rocketry sector of innovation it's it doesn't move that fast because regulatory you have to be safe like you have to raise a lot of money and you have to take a lot unfortunately of the safety yes. <laughs> yeah exactly so if i could point of view like a lot of unsafe rocket science that goes on but like at the end of the day like those are risks you need to take as an entrepreneur. And so I quickly learned that, but maybe this is something I'll come back to in a few years, because there's a lot of regulatory guidance that needs to be issued for these private space exploration companies and business models that need to be worked out because like we were going to do a nonprofit and we didn't end up pursuing it because I ended up getting pretty interested in biotech. I went out and actually started working after I, I left that, I guess that rocket endeavor I got to university started working in biotech and actually worked on kidney transplantation we were building a cooling device for kidneys during a transplant and it's going to eliminate 
but basically the need for dialysis, which is when you, after a transplant, need to hook yourself up to a blood filtering machine. And we basically, you know, eliminate a lot of costs associated with kidneys warming during a transplant. And again, that was something that I didn't know that much about, but because like we're engineers, like we learn things fast and the important thing is to like learn how to learn. And so I did that for two years and we issued some IP and things were going like pretty well. And I got the crypto bug in late 2020 and I was like doing a lot of learning because there was a software engineer I was working with who was like exploring programming and solidity. My friend turned me on to Solana like a while ago and I started like doing research on like blockchain technology and like what it is. And I was like, this is another great example. It's like pretty complicated compared to like my mechanical kind of like real world. And this isn't the real world, but like physical systems. But I quickly, I mean, relatively quickly learned now some blockchain technology and realized that this is like a space that's moving so fast. And that was the common theme that I had been like searching for. And it was moving so fast, I wanted to be a part of it. And so you fast forward, I did some music stuff. I went and met you, Alejandro, at East Denver by randomly showing up to the Mountain Dow, which was a awesome hacker house put on in Salt Lake, where I'm based out of now. And my life started to move like pretty fast in the crypto sphere. And after working on the music project, I met a really awesome team. It's the Cypher team. And I was as an intern there, went to the Bahamas conference just a few months ago, or I guess two months ago. And then like recently joined their team full-time doing research and kind of business stability. I knew I should have deterred you from attending the Bahamas Hacker House. Hey, it is an amazing overview. Building rock is the- so oh. cool. Yeah, sorry for the, I think it requires a lot of t- a context because I'm just like a person who like, likes to learn really abstract things and apply them quickly. And yeah, it started with rockets. I actually started with music and then it came. That's also awesome. in this. I just want to really quickly mention that Australia and I'm pretty sure New Zealand, they've recently been getting into like the space exploration and we have an Australian space agency, ASA. However, when it was announced, there was a legitimate push by the public and by the public, I mean, like people on Reddit to call it ARS, ARS, A-R-S-E, which stand for Australian Research and Space Exploration. <laughs> nice. That is actually, you love to see. If we go to the chat section on the right, I sent you a link. Actually, let's try this share. It's going to be dangerous, but I think I can share my screen can you see it now yes i can how funny is that that is incredible that's like pretty like witty for like rocket enthusiasts because they're generally like i will not generalize i apologize the ones that i interacted with were like pretty conservative in terms of they need to engineer this stuff to work because it's really important it's really important. To be fair though, this is pretty witty, if that's a very generous word. It's very Australian. <laughs> okay. I don't that's think that they were particularly like rocket enthusiasts. It's one of those things that you don't have to be deep into the rockets or the science to be really excited to see the advancement. And I think that especially at a national level, it is very easy to be very US centric. Even when you don't live in the US, you're just like, oh, science is advancing. Elon is launching rockets or Harvard is doing whatnot. But it's really cool when you have like your country be like, yeah, we can build rockets too. And this like supersonic airplanes will be able to go from one hour to anywhere in the world. That's a big deal from Australia. So yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I I wanted to ask, with music, most of us are only ever exposed to the final output. And it's something that we can enjoy effortlessly. We've got the sensory element of it. And even then, especially depending on the quality of your speakers, there's a lot of subtlety to the music that we may not be picking up. It's just like a beat uh, and we go with it. I know that there's many layers to the music you can start unpacking. And I know that some of the people that are more 
like deeper into the music space, or maybe if you take some LSD, you can actually pull apart all the instruments and just see like the synergy between them and you can actually see sounds. So I was just really curious to know from your experience whether being a musician for so long and now being in like more technical scientific areas, whether there may actually be a pretty strong overlap between, I don't know, it could be like frameworks for thinking or approaching things or anything at all that you feel like the music may have helped you transition to rockets or you've basically reinvented yourself? Oh, absolutely. I think one of the really important parts about being a musician, at least the way that I, I was trained classically, but one thing you had these two sides of the coin in music, a lot of them, generally, and you've got your ear and then you've got your ability to technically read music. And a lot of times people separate those two. And, and I actually will argue that they're integral to each other because you need, you're never going to hit every single note ever when you're reading music on the spot. You need to have, maybe some people can, but it, you're like, the time that you spend, it becomes like logarithmic, right? Like you, to get that last like 1% accuracy, you need to spend like 10, 10 times as many hours like reading music. And it's just honestly, from an efficiency standpoint, not worth it. And so the way you compensate for that is with your ear and being able to understand the key that you're in and like the genre of the music and music that you're with will influence a lot on like how you handle yourself when you're not on track with the music or what you're supposed to be. And I think as an engineer and entrepreneur, I think it's a really important lesson that you learn that you're never going to hit every single note. And the most important parts of when you're off, when you're out of sync and you're off beat with your duo, trio, jet, orchestra, whatever you're playing with, any genre of music or in any work setting, like the defining moments are the ones in which you can get back on board and like how you can finesse that. And I think it's allowed me to pivot like a lot of times in my life because you realize the non-linearity of these engineering concepts as well as music. And it's people like to try to make things linear in life when in reality, it is truly the most like non-linear function. It can, it can be arduous, not even continuous. I, I like believe that you need to find linearity in the non-linearity like of life. But in music, you certainly learn that you need to be technical, but when you get off, you need to get back on or else you're not going to make it. <laughs> it's interesting you mention that because as I said, most of us experience music as like a final product or you may go to a concert and you'd be like, oh, that was shit. That didn't sound like the original one. So it, it's really interesting to hear from a musician that it is actually quite common to fall off track and then having to find your way back in. And it's certainly the case with everything in life. Sort of what a hilarious story. Not many people know, at least in the crypto world, that I am a fabulous actor. I was destined to be the next Will Smith without the slapping. <laughs> and yeah, so when I was in like seventh, eighth, ninth grade, we had a yearly play in my school and I was winning awards. Anyway, long story short. My career ended early because I had to study. I may have been failing some units. But that last year, we practiced the entire year for this play, which I guess would have been like the more complex one as you grow up. Yeah. The plays were getting more interesting. They had more substance to it. I was going to be my, my Grammy moment or whatever. Yeah. Pulitzer did. The play had like the second or third scene was very similar to the second last scene because it was like a cyclical nature to the play. And very much like you have described, I guess that when something doesn't quite go right on set, you improvise and get back to where you were. Dude, I kid you not. One of the girls came out on the second or third scene and she mixed up her lines and she started saying her lines for the second last scene. Oh and I'm just standing there. Like, Surely somebody will correct her. Everyone kept acting. Like the play basically jumped like an hour worth of acting. <laughs> it ended in like 23 minutes. 
and my parents were recording and they were like, it's your best play ever. And I was like, look, I'm happy to know that you love me, but this was a piece of shit. <laughs> this was embarrassing. And I was asking people like, couldn't you realize that play A made no sense? And anyway, long story short, it was a very useful lesson in yeah just improvising and i don't know i don't think i'm over it to be honest <laughs> no that is the greatest example of like in the moment you cannot go back and redo what's already been done and you have an option and it's more of a way to follow along because the option to go back and rewind is not ever an option <laughs> you have to go along with whatever has been done at that point so that resonates with me quite a bit that may be a really interesting segue for the thing that we were talking about just before we jumped online the state of the markets oh man oh, depending man. on when you're listening to this dear listener everything is going to shit <laughs> it's not looking fantastic because we've got so OMC meeting tomorrow and they're going to let us know whether or not, I guess this is like concerning every, a lot of things are correlated to the U S stock market. And if we do see the 75 basis points rate increase, it could certainly send equities quite a bit lower. Yes. If I had to describe what's happening, traditional markets are taking a beat just as much, if not more than crypto. And I think that is something that really needs context because I find it fascinating that my friends that have traditional stock portfolios are all like deep in the red, but they don't really know what's happening in crypto. And it is surprisingly common for people that have crypto to only have crypto. Like they don't really have that much exposure to like traditional equities. So when you tell them that Netflix is down 90%, they're like, oh, really? Oh, yeah. I guess that makes sense. We could all see that one coming. But so yeah, it's... Probably a first good step to point out that this is a more macro issue and it's not yeah. just crypto failing because of crypto. We're just entangled in a deep web of many issues. And I'll be, I'll go out here and maybe make a contentious point, but I do, I can probably base it and in, in quite a bit of evidence, but a lot of the runs in crypto, we've seen like crazy price increases across many layer ones and their applications built on top has been purely a function of monetary policy, accommodative monetary policy, because a lot of these products are not securities. I, I won't go out and make that claim. I, I, I don't believe a lot of them are, but like securities go up for a reason because they like accrue value with the underlying company. And the issue that you see with a lot of currencies is that they are completely a fundraising mechanism, like free money. And so the issue is like, it's not surprising that a lot of coins are like 99%, 99%, like every week, because there's nothing holding them up. And this is different for layer one. There's like proof of stake, you're like paying for security, which, I, which makes a lot more sense. But we got to be real and look at ourselves in the mirror and go, I was buying a coin named after a dog, and I'm surprised now that it's down 95%. And if you just say that out loud, especially in the context of like a global macroeconomic outlook, it's just obscene. It's absurd. And it's been a privilege for a lot of us to create space. Buying the coin named after a dog and it being down 95%, to me, are perfectly acceptable and reasonable, both things. <laughs> Where you start going into the irrationality element is how much money you put on the dog. So yeah, look, absurd, like, just to follow up on your point, I'm guessing you would have been like in primary school during the 2018 crisis. I think that there's a big distinction between 2018 and 2022. And I may lose some friends and future guests for saying this, but 2008 or, 20, or 2008 or 2018. 2008, I was young, but I've got some memories. No, I'm referring specifically to the crypto 2018. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. I think it was macro stuff. Okay. Yeah. So crypto 2016, 2017, 2018, 
to be belonged. The only thing that there was to do in Ethereum was to have ICOs. And every man of the dog was having ICOs. Like we had a little syndicate here in Australia, a bit of telegram chat with a spreadsheet and I was on the poor side. So we'd throw five to 10 ETH to everything that moved. Some, we actually got the tokens, some projects, we never even got the tokens. Like it was an epic disaster. And the pitch decks were the lowest possible quality. Like it was clear that people were not even reading through the pitch decks because it was actually a mockery of common sense, like an insult to the average thinking brain. And these people were raising five, 10, 15 million. And I was talking to my friend here in Australia, an acquaintance. And I was like, dude, this makes no sense. It's not sustainable. And he's like, while there's money in the street, you've got to have an ICO. And I was like, ah. actually a really good point. <laughs> Probably left yeah. money on the table, but ethically, I just couldn't do it. I actually worked in a real project and it ended up being a disaster and I lost a bunch of money. But <laughs> yeah, the, thing that has, yeah, I know. <laughs> the thing that changed with 2021 and 2022, and by the way, after the crazy bonanza, when the bear market started, the authorities and the litigators, like they pounced and it was wild. Obviously all these ICOs were securities because you had no product, you had nothing. And you were offering promises of future return that were completely dependent on the team's work. Anyway, 2021 starts 2022 and it'd be really interesting to see like a detailed evolution of the NFT space because we did have art at some point. We, did, we do have like real creators innovating and doing real stuff. We spend the first half of the podcast just like praising what you guys are doing with your project. However, two things are happening that are probably not very healthy. And I think that not going to come back. The first one is every man and the dog having a PFP project, like every day. Yeah. When we reached the point where people that I know and I respect were saying, what are we minting today? What are we minting today? Are we minting something? Every day, like how many of these projects can be successful? So I think that people knew that maybe not all of them were going to be successful, but you wanted to hedge your bets. That led to some rugs, which is the real issue. The market may be saturated. It just makes it more competitive. But the real issue was like the blatant rugs and people really trying to take advantage of the situation. And the second issue that I see you said, to your point, a lot of these teams definitely saw NFTs as a way to fundraise money for a project later on. And this is really shit because these may be legit teams that are going to actually develop something with it. It may just put them in the category of a security. And there's a really strange paradox that the regulators only go after the successful projects if you have no money <laughs> and no one knows of you. It just slips under the rug. But it is the teams that raise whatever a few million and now they've got a a war chest to build something that the regulators are going to come knocking. So I think that, yeah, that definitely created a, a bit of a storm where we do need a bit of a flush out and it is super painful because early stage bear market, everything goes down, like everything. I don't have many shit coins and I'm massively down anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah. And. You said most of the important points and like rugs are just a function of liquidity generally. Like as long as there's people who are gambling there and I, mean, I consider myself a degenerate gambler as well, but it's important to realize that it's like glorified gambling at the end of the day, because you're just shooting a bunch of shots, hoping one lands when people, uh, yeah, and I, I don't need to comment further on it. I think it's like pretty obvious in hindsight. I want to incriminate yourself. <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious in hindsight, like the techniques that were used and, and why they were used. And we'll look at ourselves in a few years ago. Dang. Remember, remember those days? And I think it's important to look at like the bigger picture about what blockchain actually is offering. And it's robust. It's really robust security. At, at the end of the day, these exploits... I'll speak away from rugs and stuff, but a lot of the exploits are really an interesting twist on Web2 systems because you have a much tougher, a much tougher set 
of users who are going to exploit your protocol at all costs. And as long as there's an exploit, it's going to get exploited. And what it results in is some really robust code that will be the foundation of a global internet, I believe. No, that's well said. I guess that when I started this segment, I got a bit carried away. I apologize. But it was less to focus on the negative and more on that trend that you mentioned. You know, as a musician, you like revert back to the mains or the trend. But yeah, after a pretty rough weekend, I was moving houses as well. And I just had my interview and test for the citizenship. So I'm a bit stressed and anxious about that. I may be an Australian now. I don't know. Did you make it? Did, did, did you make it? I passed. I passed. Let's I, go. I, Let's go. I was very stressed. But no, the test is really funny. And some people, when this new test roll, was rolled out, some people were saying that it was like unethical. Because <laughs> some of the questions are like trick questions. And I was like, look, <laughs> Maybe I'm not going to comment if it's ethical or unethical. What I do know is that if you get the question wrong, maybe there's an issue here. Like, for instance, some of the questions were like, when you become an Australian citizen, you're committed to a system of, it was like capitalism, democracy, communism. And I was like, look, I know what the right answer is. <laughs> if someone marks capitalism, I mean... They're not wrong, although not on paper. But if someone chooses communism, like, get them the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and there were some questions like that. There was another one that was like, it is a privilege of Australian citizenship to be able to vote in federal elections, be able to receive welfare. <laughs> and I was like, once again, like, technically not untrue. But if you choose that you just want to receive wealth, get them the fuck out. So anyway, it, it was just really interesting. Fantastic. Great to hear you, Vader. Yeah. And just to add something, we need to run here in a, in a few minutes. We got our, if you're listening, Cypher Mainnet is actually launching next week. It's not a near protocol, but we've got a lot of work to do. Okay. What is, if you could give me like a really quick liner, what does Cypher do and what are you doing with them? Cypher offers dated futures on Solana. If you're familiar with futures contracts, we offer dated futures, which is different than perpetual futures, right? Perpetual futures are a way to get long and like spot assets without actually like having to borrow to get long with spot. And so you pay it in funding rates and they're actually pretty expensive to hold for like long periods of time. But dated futures, they're much more, they expire, right? And so you've got like a three month dated future where at the end of the month, your contract expires and converges to the price of the underlying Oracle that you're getting the price feeds from. And so it's cool because you don't pay like a funding rate on futures, depending on how your like borrowing lending mechanism works. But it's going to be pretty interesting to see how they're traded in this market because we're launching pair futures. So BTC ETH, Sol ETH, and then like P, which is an index. And I think it's going to be pretty interesting because pair futures don't move the same way as the denominated assets move. They move relative to each other. So you could potentially be long like BTC ETH. And if ETH underperforms, the ratio will actually increase and you know, it'll result in the gain. And you can be long and they can both be going down at the same time. Was that a deciding factor in doing that kind of pairing as opposed to USD pairs or? It was, I joined the team after the decision had been made to launch pair futures, but there's a lot of already USD denominated futures on Solana and like on many blockchains. And so a pair of futures are pretty interesting, especially for volatile market conditions. And they offer like unique exposure to crypto assets. And so it makes a decent amount of sense initially to implement that just because there's like less of those kinds of assets. And so, yeah, we offer we're launching with those three assets and we'll be expanding on to a few more pair of futures in the near future. <laughs> in the near future. Yay. Yeah, so I work, I'm on the research team, like business development and research. And so we're like working at margining system, math behind how we are going to liquidate users if they fall below like margin requirements. And there's some really cool things that we're doing here to really improve the protocol security of the derivative trading platforms. 
it's really important that you have a solvent platform. As we've seen in the past few weeks, we've had quite a few funds or a trading platform get pretty hurt. Like Drift Protocol was one of the ones and so got hurt because of just a few flaws in the like risk management system. And so I think it's really important. We're really proud of like how robust our protocol is. Not kind of, we're doing the best we can, but that's what we offer. That's awesome. Where does the initial liquidity come from? Is it okay. all pairs of like positions open by people? Do you guys offer an initial order book for people yeah. to start taking? So we're running on the Serum order book. And so orders are placed on the Serum central limit order book. And the way that initial liquidity is applied to our assets are these users called minters, which essentially are short selling to the market. They're providing USDC as collateral for all of these assets. And so you get paid a percent of the transaction fees as a minter in order providing that service. Because if you deposit USDC and the price like goes up of the asset, you need to deposit more collateral because you're undercollateralized. So you're like effectively selling short. And if it goes down, you're above your collateral requirements. So you can remove some, but you've got these two people these two forces in the equation, which are mentors, and then the people who are actually trading up on top of those mentors. And so, yeah, that's at a high level how it works. Amazing. If you're interested, hypothetically, as part of your research, check out Spin Finance and Tonic yep. on Near. Tonic is interesting because my understanding is that Tonic is going to be that base layer similar to Serum on Near. In fact, I already know a project building on top of Tonic using that centralized order book. Both are much early stage. Spin Finance is in mainnet now with limited pairs. And I think Tonic just went on mainnet with limited pairs as well. And we're in talks with them to bootstrap some initial liquidity. So it's definitely a much younger ecosystem. But yeah, if you guys were interested either to expand this protocol or if you start looking for a new job, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> no, certainly. I think there's a lot of power in being a cross protocol trading platform, but you sacrifice liquidity, especially in the current environment that you've got on a single chain. And I know people who are working on cross-chain liquidity sourcing, which is a really foundational point, uh, are a part of the evolution of blockchain and, and DeFi. And you've re really got to have shared liquidity across. It's just like a no-brainer. You may have heard that Wormhole is creating a bridge to Near. So I think it's going to bring together the Solana and Near communities. We already have Old Bridge. Old Bridge works really well, both Jorora and Near. I am very mindful of your time, so let's start wrapping it up. When we started a long time ago, it seems time flies by. We're talking about the resources for developers. I would encourage you, invite you to look into the Near documentation because I've heard from teams that have participated in both Near hackathons and they're both Rust-based blockchains that Near is actually a breeze to develop in. The tooling is good, the documentation is good. And I don't know if you've heard, they're just releasing a JavaScript SDK. Yeah, that's really exciting. They're looking at the 18, 20 million JavaScript developers out there. First and only blockchain to have full-fledged JavaScript compatibility. And I'm certainly excited for the future of Near. I, I do think that they're really doing an awesome job of focusing on developer resources. And yeah, there's certainly no reason in the, in the, in the long-term future that Cypher cannot also be on near, at least the way I see it. I love it. Couple more things before I let you go. I had this on my agenda in my head. This has been a very loose interview. Do you remember, and this is pertinent to the market conditions, do you remember when we were at the Coinbase party yeah. at East Denver? Yep. Yeah. That was fun. I was on fire. I basically had like a standard routine. I was saying some outrageous shit. It was pretty incredible. I remember they, they were like, but that was insane. Like the quality of some of those parties was ridiculous. How like fancy some of them were. <laughs> it was crazy to be there, but it was just like, whoa, what kind of like marketing team is in charge of these things? They're insane. And I was blown away. By I am almost certain that the marketing team in charge of those parties, they've all been fired now. <laughs> it sounds horrible, but 
Yes, Coinbase it's just laid off 18% of their staff, which yeah. is a pretty sizable chunk. And the party was beautiful. It was Coinbase Cloud. The downstairs area had an interactive section where you could, what was it? It was a mixture between like physical and like visual and noise. It was very trippy. I don't know. I didn't yeah. get it. Upstairs, free flowing drinks all night. And there were two things I remember clearly. The first one was I was slightly and I, on the edge and I was just hungry. So I walked up to a long table, beautifully designed table where I was told there was food. It was a salad bar, a fucking hot salad bar. Come on guys. If you're going to spend like the big bucks throwing an amazing party with an open bar, get some real food. <laughs> yep. They were growing salad on the walls, but. It was still pretty. It was still a salad bar. Agreed. Yeah, the walls looked beautiful because there were plants in them. Plants are decoration, not food. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting like a sweet roast. Like, where's the perfect market? <laughs> the... Anyway, the second thing that I remember, and this is the core, it's the core Patrick, this is what we want people to depart with. It was a Coinbase engineer. <laughs> <laughs> There was a Coinbase engineer that I met on my way to the bar. Fascinating conversation. We're having a, a riveting exchange. Angela asks what he does, and he's, I work for Coinbase. <laughs> and my reaction was like, and I don't know. I may have said something else, but he was clearly very offended. And then I spent the rest of the night being like, I'm sorry. And this person was running away from me, almost took a restraint order. I guess what I'm trying to say is, without further incriminating myself, is if you are that Coinbase engineer and you've been laid off, <laughs> do and be what we want you at near. There's a future for you <laughs> in the actual decentralized world. Yeah. Well said. Certainly well said. The last thing I want to say, and I want you to be a witness, is I paid for my full trip to East Denver. I could have probably asked for some sort of grant or something, but whatever, it was last minute. And I don't, didn't really go to many talks, but I met a lot of people, like so much potential. There's been a few things that we've followed through. And as you mentioned, our friend, we don't have to mention him by name, but since not only did we get him over from Solana, but he's actually accepted a job now with Pagoda, formerly in your Inc., formerly in your foundation. So yeah, I would like to count that as my ROI for attending yep. the conference. Can I claim that one, Patrick? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's fantastic to hear. Awesome. I want my, I guess the next one would be Nearcon in Portugal. Yes. I want my flights at least. Fuck man, Australia is far and petrol is only getting more expensive. Yeah, it's brutal. It's everything's brutal right now. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Hopefully I see you there. I can't promise anything, but hopefully. We'll find a way. Patrick, we're getting to the end. This is the rapid fire session. Are you ready? Absolutely. I ask this of most guests. But very few of the guests have a brain big enough to build an actual rocket. So I would be really <laughs> curious to find out if there are any books that you're reading currently that you would recommend to people or just in your resources. Have you watched any movies that have caught your interest? How do you spend your spare time? It's a great question. Recently, a lot of my spare time has been, well, reading a lot. I read a lot of papers. <laughs> I like technical I, papers, I, scientific. Yeah, technical papers. I because I'm a research junkie, I guess. And so, w one of the things that like I do to distress is I make music in my free time. That's like my a reading equivalent. But what I am reading is like mainly technical papers, just about the innovations. Mainly like looking into borrowing and lending stuff right now like deep theoretic models and stuff like that. But I won't go on. I feel like I don't have a great answer. I'm like, 
making, I would make a lot of music during my free time, but I am not like reading a, a current book right now. It's actually a really good answer, very topical, given that the current lending and borrowing market is just imploding. Yeah. So it's their model decentralized. Like, the models are really trivial. It's concerning to see a lot of them. I wrote a brief article at, for Cypher about like lending and borrowing models. And it's not that technical. It's technical, but I talk about the application of some of the like controller mechanisms we use, like engineering, mechanical engineering, to control electronics and stuff like that. This is the how a drone altitude control r relates to dynamic interest rates in DeFi credit protocols. Yes, that's the one. Thanks so much for supplying that article as part of the recommended read for me to yeah, okay. for, for the podcast. I didn't yes. watch or see the level of complexity, but it is fascinating. So maybe if you give us a really quick summary and I'll make sure to include it on the description. Yeah, totally. This synopsis is basically that we you know, lending and borrowing protocols usually adjust like interest rates depending on like your utilization ratio, which is like a ratio of like your landed assets to like the ones that you have in the pool. And they'll decide on an optimal utilization ratio. It's pretty arbitrary, but it has, it factors in like the risk of the asset and to decide how they increase borrow rate. They use a linear piecewise function, which is just two lines, essentially. Jet improved that and has three lines now. But it, each, the slope where it changes is like an optimal utilization ratio if you're pulling it like on the x-axis and the y-axis. And so the cool thing is if you treat this like a controller, uh, uh, like a system controller, like a PID controller, which is something that's used in the engineering all the time, essentially you can vary the interest rates, assuming you've got a baseline equilibrium, you can vary interest rates to it. When, whenever the pool gets out of whack, you can quickly increase or decrease dynamically those interest rates versus just using a linear piecewise function to increase it a lot when utilization is super high and then inc and not have it increase at all when the utilization is super low. You can construct this controller, this PID controller, and dynamically vary those rates to achieve like more time spent at the optimal utilization ratio. Essentially, it's what it does. Interesting. So this would be a generic principle for optimization that technically... Totally. And... It's one thing I want to be from like preface. It's not a, I, it's not a paper. I haven't formalized this. I have equations and I have like a little processes and I have the code like written on my computer to like implement this at a pretty basic level. There's like a lot more learning to be done about what those baseline interest rates are. But yeah, if they're interested, please have me reach out because I think this is a very important part of DeFi. There was one paper that was written on it by Delphi Digital. I think it was about a year ago. But other than that, I haven't seen a ton of other work done on it. And there's a, a lot to formalize and expand on it. You can do some pretty cool stuff with it. Yeah. Alejandro, it was fantastic speaking with you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. And that's the end of another show. I want to apologize because you may have noticed it was a bit of an abrupt ending. Uh, we seem to have had a bit of a technical issue towards the end there. However, as always... I want to thank you for being amazing and remind you that everything in this show is for entertainment and educational purposes only. If you enjoyed the show, please consider sharing with your friends. We have some amazing interviews coming up. If you have any questions or feedback, our DMs are open. The best way to contact us is on Twitter. See ya!